All right, so the next thing that I kind of want to get into um, is the Assignments tab. So I'm going to click on the Assignments link in the course navigation. And it will open up our Assignments page. So this is, I'm just going to delete this out because you won't be able to see that. So by default, this is exactly what your um, uh, Assignments page will look like. So there will be one assignment group named assignments that's kind of automatically generated for you. So if you remember back to the calendar and we, when we created that assignment shell, one of the options was to change the group. Well, our only option was assignments because that's the only thing that's created for us. We can create additional groups very easily and that's kind of what I want to show you now. This is a great time again to have your syllabus in front of you. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys, you know, have uh, groups in your syllabus, whether, you know, you do points or percentages, kind of, you know, have those groups and you can group your assignments in there. Definitely recreate that right on this page in your Canvas course. So to create a new group, I'm just going to come up here to the plus group button and select that and just give my group a name. So maybe this is my, um, you know, quizzes group. Select save and then a group is added. Maybe I'll create a discussions group. And I don't know, maybe I'll create a homework group too. So when I have these groups created, I now have the ability to do two things. I can um, average out all of my assignments. So maybe if my uh, class is based off of a point scale, to get an A in my class, maybe I have to get, you know, like 1,500 points to 2,000 points. Um, that way I would average out all of the assignments. So to do that, I would click on the main gear icon and then uncheck this box which says weight the final grade based on the assignment groups. I would need this to be unchecked. So when I save that, all of the um, assignments on the page will actually be averaged out depending on, you know, how much those uh, assignments are worth. So it would total up the total amount of points for each assignment. It would, you know, figure out how uh, many points the student received on them and then it would divide them all automatically so it would give you an average of them. Um, the other way to kind of set this up is if you are on a percentage scale. So to get an A in my class, I would get 100%. That way you would most likely weight your groups. To do that, I would go back up to the gear icon and I would check weight the final grade based on the assignment groups. Now I can uh, give, um, I can set a percentage amount for each of these groups to be what they're worth. So if I want my assignments, maybe they're worth 10% of the overall grade, quizzes to be 40%, discussions 20, homework 30, you know, whatever it is, I can total that out to 100%. Now when I click on save, these little bubble icons will appear telling me that, okay, this assignment group is now worth 10% of the total score. This quizzes group is worth 40% of the overall score. So you can have Canvas kind of do the math for you if you'd like. What that does is it averages out the group and then that average will be worth whatever percentage amount that you have here. The other nice thing about creating groups is that you can automatically have um, items in the group drop. So maybe if you're wanting to drop the lowest score or something like that, you can come to the individual gear icon and select edit. And then you'll have the option to ignore certain scores. So if you wanted to ignore like the two lowest scores, you could definitely do that. If for some reason you wanted to ignore a high score, you can also do that. You can actually set a rule saying that I never want a certain score dropped. So maybe, you know, like my essay number one, they, it has to account for their grade no matter what. I can set that as a rule and now all of the other assignments uh, will be you know, dropped. The two lowest scores of the other assignments will be dropped, but uh, never will essay number one be dropped. So if I set that rule, it'll actually appear right next to that bubble, so I can hover my mouse over my students and, you know, me as the teacher would be able to see what rules I've set. Okay. So now that I have these groups set up, um, I can easily drag and drop items 
uh, to the groups. So if I have, you know, maybe something in um, not in the right place, I can just drag and drop it very easily to the correct group. Now that we have these groups set up, um, you know, we created these assignment shells on the calendar. You can also create assignment shells right here on this page. To do that, I would click on the plus icon. So maybe this is homework. I could create on that, I could click on that plus icon and now create an assignment shell just as I did on the calendar. So maybe this is homework one, could set a due date. Now that I'm in a class, I can actually set the point value as well. So I can easily create that now that the groups are made. Now that we have these assignment shells here, you know, um, I'm sure you're saying to yourself, yeah, that's great, but I want my students to actually submit their work to it. I want to put the directions in the assignment so they can access Canvas and see all that good stuff, right? Well, to do that, you'll just open up the assignment. So I'm just going to click on the title of the assignment that I want to edit. And you can see it literally says no content. So this is an assignment shell that we created. It does not allow students to uh, submit anything to it. It says no content, kind of just like a placeholder. But now we're going to open up the a page and we're going to change those options. So again, there's that pencil icon. I'm just going to select that and the page will open up for us. Now we can uh, put some content in here. So I'm sure, you know, you guys will migrate stuff over from another learning management system. That's totally fine. Um, you know, all of that content should come over here uh, kind of automatically and you'd be able to utilize that content. But if you're kind of starting from scratch, this is how you would do it. So maybe, you know, before I used Canvas, I kind of had just like text files of assignments. If you have that, you could simply just copy and paste those directions uh, right into Canvas and all of the formatting will stick, so that's kind of nice. I uh, definitely utilize the rich content editor, which is this bar up here. Uh, you know, the first line allows you to bold, italicize, underline, change the color, um, highlight. You can uh, center the text. Um, you can, um, you know, have bulleted or numbered lists. Um, you can utilize the second option to kind of do some more fancy stuff. Uh, you can create tables if you want. You can um, upload URLs. You can embed images. There's a math equations editor. Um, in the course level settings, um, you're, you can uh, turn on some apps. Uh, this is actually an app that's turned on. I'll show you how you can turn those on in just a second. Um, you actually have the ability to record yourself or upload media. So remember back into the inbox where we can turn our webcam and microphone on. I can actually do that in an assignment or on a page or in a discussion, anything like that. Um, and then I have some options to kind of uh, format the um, text on the right-hand side. Um, I do kind of just want to show you really quick how easy it is to embed an image. So in the Rich Content Editor, like I said, there's this embed image. Canvas is actually teamed up with um, the Flickr Creative Commons images. Um, if I select the Flickr tab after selecting the embed image option, I can just search for a generic image. So maybe this assignment is on dogs and I want to kind of just add a generic image in here. I can uh, type out dogs and search for it, and now I can just select a dog and add it to that page. So it's really easy to get an image in there. Um, you can see it's kind of big. I can just click on the image once and then utilize the corners to kind of drag the image to make it smaller. So again, I utilized that embed image option and searched the Flickr Creative Commons and then um, embedded an image there. I'm sure you're saying, yeah, that's great, but my assignments have, you know, specific images that relate to the assignment itself, right? Maybe I'm teaching a humanities class and I want my uh, students to um, compare and contrast two images. Well, if you have those images, you can upload them to your files and then come over to the insert content into the page area and select the images tab. If you remember, I actually uploaded an image when we were there and I can select that image and now that will sit right in the assignment. So if you're wanting, you know, specific images, you can definitely do that as well. Same thing, I can click on the image once and then utilize the corners to kind of just resize it if I want. So it's really nice, you know, I took an art history, I actually have an art history degree, um, and so I took a lot of art history classes and it was really annoying, you know, my teacher would give us the assignment on paper in class 
and then she would email us the um, images that she wanted us to look at, and then we would have to go to a separate Turnitin site to turn it in to turn our paper in, and it was just like so many different things. You know, rubrics were you know on their website. You know, all of these different things were in different places. Well, Canvas allows you to kind of combine all of those items, put them on one page for the student to access in one area, which is kind of cool. Okay, so I can scroll down and um, kind of we're going to kind of talk about the options we have for an assignment. I created this assignment shell on the calendar, which I was not able to add a point value to, so I can easily just add that point value right here. The assignment group just changes where the assignment sits. It's the same thing as going to the assignments tab and uh, dragging and dropping the item. Um, I have the ability to display the grade as a few different things, so by default it's points, but I definitely can do a complete, incomplete, maybe a letter grade, percentage, GPA scale, or ungraded. The submission type is probably the most important option. Um, the no submission is uh, set by default, but the no submission and on paper option are exactly the same. Um, they're just named differently. Um, it does not allow students to uh, submit anything to the assignment shell, to the assignment Dropbox. Uh, you have to select online for them to submit something to Canvas. So when I select online, I have a few different options here. The text entry option just gives them literally a box in which they can type in. It's definitely um, not recommended for really lengthy papers because it doesn't have spell check, doesn't even have that rich content editor. It's just literally a box in which they type in. So maybe reserve that for uh, journal entries or something short like that. The website URL allows them to copy and paste a URL in there. Maybe they have a Prezi project or something like that that they're wanting uh, that you're wanting to grade. Media recordings allows them to turn on their webcam and microphone and record themselves using um, you know, the, um, that feature. I've seen this done in speech classes, online speech classes, and foreign language classes. They also have the ability to upload content too. Um, kind of the standard, what you'll probably be using the most is the file uploads option. This allows students to just upload any sort of file. So this is your you know, PDF, doc, docx, Excel, PowerPoint, any type of file that they can upload um, to this area. You can actually restrict the file uploads if you'd like. Um, so you can click on that and then um, you know, put an extension in there and then that's the only thing students would be able to submit. Um, just scrolling down, uh, we have the ability for group assignments and peer reviews. If I check on group assignments, um, uh, it kind of gives me the ability to allow for self-sign up for these groups. I can uh, have Canvas split my students up into a certain amount of equal groups, or I could create those groups manually. Um, the split students into a certain amount of equal groups works really nicely if you're wanting to kind of create a group project real fast. The nice thing about group projects is it kind of creates a miniature Canvas course for group members, so they'd be able to get in there and upload files, start discussions, all of that good stuff, and they'd have a place to kind of uh, gather and, and work on a project. I'm just going to X out of that. The next option we have is peer reviews. So again, we can manually assign those peer reviews or automatically have Canvas assign them. If you have it automatic, it's nice because students don't have to wait for their assigned person to, um, to turn their paper in. It would just assign them, you know, the last person who submitted. Then at the very bottom, we have the ability to set our due date and our available window. So, um, you know, the available window actually allows them access to click on the assignment. Um, and then the due date is just that when, you know, the due date is. So maybe if you accept late work, you're wanting your students to, you know, um, have access to the assignment on Monday. You want the due date to be Thursday, but you'll accept late work until Friday. You could actually have the available from on that Monday. You could have the due date on Thursday, and then you could have the until date on Friday. So students would not be able to submit anything after Friday. Um, the due date set to Thursday, so the gradebook would, you know, flag it as red, saying that the student turned it in late, and then the available date would be the first time in which they could uh, click on the assignment to access it. You definitely don't have to, um, you know, put a date in here if you want your students to access the content, um, you know, forever. You can actually just just leave these blank. You can do as much or as um, little as, you know, inputting the, the dates as you want.
Yeah, so um, question is, um, can you select more than one of these options? For sure, you can select as many or as few as you want and students will have the ability to actually um, choose the way that they want to uh, submit it. Um, another uh, question, will um, Turnitin integration be seamless? Definitely will. If that's a feature that your school has, um, there'll actually be a, a checkbox here so you can um, check the Turnitin option. I, I actually don't have it on my screen, but you'll, you will be able to see it. You'd be able to um, check that Turnitin box and then it will automatically run through Turnitin. Um, you'll be able to see those scores in the gradebook as well. Um, just remind me if I forget uh, to show you where you can access that score once we're in the gradebook. Okay, so question, um, when creating multiple uh, assignments, all with the same settings, is there any way to avoid having to reselect the settings for each of the new assignments? Unfortunately, you'd have to create all of the assignments and set all of the settings um, individually. But the nice thing is, is that once you do that, you can actually copy the entire course, you can copy assignments from one course, from one Canvas course to another. So if you're teaching different sections or whatever like that, you just have to create that content once and then you can copy the content from one course to another. All right, so um, I'm just going to update this assignment. Everything that we change, we always have to save or update. And um, everything that we create, we always have to publish to allow students access to it. So that publish button is up here at the top. All right, so now our assignment is created. Students would be able to see that image. They'd be able to see our directions. They'd be able to see when it's due, uh, what it's worth, what they can submit, all of that good stuff, all on one page. The other nice option we have is to um, create a rubric for this assignment. So maybe if you're utilizing a rubric for grading, definitely input that rubric, create that rubric right in uh, the assignment itself. So you can see after I saved the assignment, I have the ability to add a rubric. I can click on that add rubric button and start creating the rubric that I'm going to utilize for this assignment. I can add some criterion down here as much as I want. I can actually uh, change the rating. So by default, there is um, zero or five points. If I hover my mouse over the ratings, it kind of turns bold and I can click it and it'll add ratings there for me. The nice thing is I don't have to have the same ratings for each criteria. And so I can build this out um, however you grade. And it's nice because students would be able to view this rubric before they turn it in, and then you would utilize this rubric for grading, and they would be able to come back to the rubric and see exactly what, you know, you selected and how you graded them. Uh, the other option is to uh, write freeform comments. So maybe if you don't want a rating scale, you can select this first, I'll write freeform comments on assessing students. And that would give you a text box in which you could type in, you know, the reason why students are receiving the score that they're receiving. Um, if you want to utilize rubrics for grading, you always have to make sure that this checkbox, use the rubric for assignment grading, is selected. Once I have that, I'll just click on create. I'll most likely get a warning. Yep, okay, so it's really important that you uh, create the rubric um, to be the same uh, value as what the assignment is worth. Right now my assignment is worth 100 points, but my rubric is worth only 15. That's a problem. So just make sure when you're creating these rubrics that, um, you know, um, the total points on the rubric is worth the same as the points for the actual assignment. So I'm just going to change that. So that's how you create a rubric. The nice thing about this is you can create a rubric and then utilize that rubric for uh, multiple assignments. So maybe if I have an essay rubric and I have four essays, I would just have to create that rubric once and then I would go to the um, assignments and then just click on find a rubric and then I could attach the rubric that I've already uh, created to those additional um, assignments. All right, so that's, we just talked about creating an assignment. Um, kind of the options you have and um, how to attach a rubric. All right, so the next kind of thing that I want to talk about um, are discussions. So I'm going to get into the discussions tab over here in the course navigation and um, the discussions page will open. I'm actually going to switch over to a course that has some content in it so we can kind of see what it looks like. 
Each discussion that you create will have kind of its own individual row, um, and they'll automatically be put into this discussion's middle area. This middle area is ordered by recent activity. So just know that, you know, whatever your students are, um, uh, whatever discussions they're submitting, that will be the first thing on this list. But there are also oh, our, uh, two different other areas. So we have pinned discussions up at the top and then closed for comments at the bottom. If you want to have like an ordered list that doesn't move, you can simply just drag the um, item up here and then this list will never move. This list will never change until you change it. I can also drag these items down to the closed for comments area and it will uh, turn the discussion into a read-only state so students would be able to see it but they wouldn't be able to reply to it. Okay, so I'm just going to go back into my sandbox course and we're going to create a new discussion. I'm going to simply just click on that plus uh, discussion button and the page will open. It should start looking familiar. You know, it's kind of the same thing that we saw on the syllabus, same thing we saw on the assignments page. We can utilize that rich content editor to add content into the page, uh, embed images and all that stuff. Um, something kind of cool, wherever this rich content editor is, you can actually embed an, a video really easily. So say, for example, I have a YouTube video that relates to my uh, course. Um, I'm just going to go into Khan Academy. That's, that's probably my safest bet, right? So maybe it's, um, you know, this one. I don't know. So I would have a video, I'd pull it up on YouTube, then I could go up to the URL, so the URL of the YouTube video, and I'm just gonna copy that. Now I can go back into my uh, Canvas course, whether it's a page, whether it's an uh, assignment, a discussion, discussion's where we are at right now, and I can right click and paste that URL right into my page. I'm sure you're saying, well, yeah, that's great, it's just a URL, right? Well, if I select enter on my keyboard, it will automatically embed that YouTube video right onto wherever I have it. So in this case, we're in a discussion, maybe I'm trying to like flip the classroom, I want you know my students to view a video, maybe it's a lecture, or something like that, I can have my video embedded in here. Maybe I can say, you know, like, uh, give them a question to respond to, you know, like, I don't know, how did you like the video? I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, you would, you know, come up with a much more awesome <laughs> question. Um, but you would put that in there. And now I'm just going to save this just to show you what it looks like. Then we'll come back and talk about the options. But now, so rather than having them uh, navigate away from Canvas to view the YouTube video, that video is automatically embedded right here. So they see the video, they can um, see the you know, question that they have to respond to, and then they can reply to it right here all on one page, which is kind of cool. So I'm just going to open this back up so we can see the um, options. If I scroll down. The first option we have is to allow threaded replies. I'm just going to open up a discussion that has some replies in it so you can see kind of what that looks like. This instructor created this introduce yourself discussion and is requiring the students to kind of say hey and upload a picture. Um, so the directions are up here. He embedded an image. Um, you can see this uh, reply field is actually here for the student to answer, uh, to respond to those um, directions. Rebecca was actually the first person to reply. She typed out some stuff and embedded an image. They ha students have the ability to utilize that rich content editor. Then you'll notice this is a threaded reply, so Rebecca's post has a reply field underneath it. So George actually selected the reply field on Rebecca's post and was able to reply to Becca. That's why those um, you know, two items are kind of attached. It shows everyone that George was replying to Rebecca. So if I scroll down, George was actually able to respond to the initial posting, so he went back up to the top and clicked on that reply field, and now he responded by embedding an image and putting some um, text in there, and now this is its own little box. So it's really easy to see who responded to who, you know, and uh, who responded to the initial post. So that's what happens when you thread the replies, when you allow threaded replies. If you don't have that option selected, all of the replies will just go to the very bottom of the page, and it's kind of hard for people to uh, realize who's responding to who. 
The next option is really cool. Users must post before seeing replies. Maybe that video that I wanted, you know, my students to watch and that question that I wanted them to answer, maybe that's, you know, I want them to, you know, think critically and come up with their own answer. Well, I don't want them to scroll down and see all of their other students' um, responses. If I select this option, students will actually have to submit their response before they see other students' responses. So that's kind of nice. Students hate it, but it's awesome for instructors, right? Um, you can actually have um, uh, a podcast feed that just creates an RSS feed if you're wanting to kind of pull that in to anywhere. The next option is um, having this discussion be graded. So if I want this to be, um, you know, a grade, I can select that. I have that ability to make it a group discussion and a peer review just like we did in the, um, in the assignment. I could put a points possible here. I have kind of the same options as well. If I scroll down to the very bottom, this is that due date and that window as well so I can set those. Um, you know, very easily. All right, so I'm just going to save this. Again, you know, any discussions that we create, any assignments that we create, we can always go back to our modules page and add those to a module. All right, so now we're kind of moving away from discussions and I'm gonna get into quizzes now. So in our course navigation, we're going to click on quizzes. Don't have any quizzes yet, but I'm going to create one. Again, there's that blue plus button. I'm going to go up and uh, select that to start a new quiz. Um, I have some settings here. There's that rich content editor, which I can utilize to, um, you know, create my directions. Um, one of the nice things is that students will be able to see the directions on every question. So, for example, if I'm in a science class and I want my students to have the periodic table as a resource, I could definitely put that up there and then they would be able to have it throughout the um, quiz. If I scroll down, I'm just going to talk about some of the options we have. So the quiz type, there's four different kinds of quizzes in Canvas. A graded quiz, which is attached to the gradebook. A practice quiz, which is not attached to the gradebook. And then we have two types of surveys, a graded survey and an ungraded survey. The difference between a quiz and a survey is that surveys are submitted anonymously. So you as the instructor won't be able to see, you know, what student submitted what survey. Um, I'm just going to scroll down. We have that assignment group option if we wanted to change that. Um, I can shuffle the answers. I can set a time limit. I can allow multiple attempts if I want. Canvas will um, ask you to, if you want to keep the highest, latest, or average score. Uh, you have the ability to allow students to see their responses if you want. Uh, you can restrict that only once after each attempt. You can have them, you know, see the correct answers. I'll tell you the first time I taught using Canvas and, you know, utilizing a quiz, I kind of just left it how it was and gave them multiple attempts. And, um, you know, they took the quiz, and then the second time they took the quiz, everyone got 100, and I was like, oh, duh, my settings were, um, you know, set so, you know, students could see the correct answers, and then they just took the quiz again and got 100. So definitely, you know, make sure that you're setting the um, options up the way you actually want. Um, you have the ability to show one question um, on the screen at a time. So I've heard this reduces, you know, test anxiety if you have a huge quiz. Um, this is also, um, you know, great for maybe nursing, uh, the nursing department that um, maybe they want to recreate state board exams. Usually that's a um, thing that they have to do is only see one question at a time. You also have the ability to lock the question after answering it. So students would only be able to move forward in the quiz. All right, so if you're in a proctored environment, maybe it's an online class, you can require a password. You can definitely do that. And then at the very bottom, you have that, you know, due date and available date as well. So this is a quiz, so we have to have questions, right? So if I scroll back up to the very top of the page, um, you can see I have two tabs. Right now I'm on the settings tab. I'm just gonna go over and click on the questions tab. And we have uh, three different options here. Any question that you create anywhere, you can always find that question and add it to a, another uh, quiz. Um, you can actually create a new question group. So if you utilize question banks, maybe there's publisher content that you're importing, maybe you know, you're just creating question banks to organize your questions, you can create a new question group and then link that question group to the, uh, um, 
to the uh, quiz or to the question bank, excuse me. But today we're just going to be talking about how to kind of start from scratch and create a new question. So that's what I'm going to select now. When I create a new question at the top, I have um, a drop down menu which lists all of the question types. Um, everything from a formula question up, I actually have to put in the correct answer and Canvas will actually grade those uh, questions automatically. The essay question and the file upload question, um, you know, you'll have to go in there and manually grade them because you can't, you know, put in a correct answer that everyone will respond. The text no question kind of is just like a banner. It allows you to split up your tests. Maybe my quiz is um, on, you know, unit one, unit two, and unit three. I could have a text no question that says unit one and then list all of my questions out. I have a text no question that says unit two, list all those questions out and so on. Uh, for this example, I'm just going to say multiple choice. Again, there's that rich content editor. I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a broken record, but I definitely want you to realize that you can utilize this rich content editor in every aspect of Canvas. So you can, you know, definitely, um, you know, do some cool stuff. I challenge you to kind of think outside the box and, um, you know, start creating really powerful, um, powerful quizzes and questions and all that good stuff. So I could definitely just do an example here. I'll do a stupid question, you know, what does a dog look like, right? Maybe, you know, if you are a um, more of a practical teacher and, you know, you're teaching how to do something using a tool or something like that, you could say, you know, what is this tool? And then in the possible answers, rather than having just text, you can open up those possible answers and there's that rich content editor so you can embed images, you can, um, you know, do videos if you want. I worked with a, a Spanish instructor who was like, yeah, I want my quizzes to be awesome and rather than having text, I'm going to record myself saying the question and then I'm going to record myself um, three more times saying one correct answer and two incorrect answers and the students have to press play and um, listen to what I'm saying and choose the correct answer. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, so in this example, I'm just going to utilize that embed image tool and go to the Flickr tab and just kind of get some images really quickly just so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to just change the aspect ratio right here because it's quicker. Uh, and I'm just going to select done. And now I'm going to go to the next possible answer and just find an image of a dog really quick. So I open that uh, possible answer up. I clicked on the pencil icon, then I clicked on the embed image icon. Now I'm going to the Flickr tab and just looking for a dog. Maybe if you're a science teacher, you know, you could like say, I don't know, find the nucleus of something. Um, nursing, you know, you could have different images of body parts, <laughs> anything you want. Okay, so now I have two images in here. My students would select the image rather than text. You can see I also have two additional possible answers. Well, I don't want those, so I'm just gonna hover my mouse over them and click on the trash can icon and they'll kind of just disappear. I also have to tell Canvas what the correct answer is. So right now it's saying that the cat is actually the correct answer, which obviously is not right. I'm gonna hover my mouse over the correct answer and you'll see that this green arrow appears. I'm just gonna select that and now that'll change that answer to the correct one. You'll also notice that there are these little speech bubble icon thingies here. Um, I can utilize those to give automatic feedback depending on how your uh, quiz settings are set up. So maybe, you know, we have a module on dogs and cats. Um, and they get this question wrong. I could say, no, check out module three for more info. Now, when they get this wrong, they would get this comment and, you know, the student would be able to realize, okay, I have to check out module three to get, you know, the information I need. Maybe you're just wanting to leave positive feedback. Oh, yeah. You know, whatever. I'm sure your comments will be much more in detail. <laughs> but it's kind of cool that you can do that and right when they submit the quiz, they'll be able to get these comments. So I'll update this question. And now that question is in my quiz, um, you know, for me to uh, give to my students to take. I would, you know, continue just to building out, build out those questions to uh, make my quiz really cool. I'm going to save this. Any quiz that you create, you always can save and preview it. So after it's saved, I can come up here to the preview button. 
And now this is what a quiz will look like for uh, students. The instructions would be up here. I would be able to see the question and then select the, um, whoa. I'd be able to select the right answer. The nice thing about Canvas is that um, you don't have to save each individual question. It automatically saves it. You just have to submit the quiz. Um, even if uh, the power goes out or the least internet connection, whatever, you as the instructor will have the ability to come in here and see what they've responded to. You can see exactly what they've done. It's actually called quiz statistics. Um, I'm just going to open up a quiz really quick so you can see where you can access that. So a quiz that I've created, I would just open that up. And then on the right hand side, this isn't a good example because it's not appearing here because this is a fake class and students haven't actually taken this quiz. But if they did, a quiz statistics link would be right here in which you could uh, click on. You could see how long the student spent on individual questions. You can see if they selected an answer and then changed their answer. You can see as a class whole how many students missed a question. You could change the answer at that point. You could. Um, award fudge points at that point, all of that good stuff would be in quiz statistics. The other option you have on this page will be the moderate this quiz option. Maybe if you have uh, students with, um, you know, ADA requirements or something like that, maybe some students need time and a half on a quiz, something like that. You can go to the individual student here and go to the pencil icon and it'll give you the option to give them extra attempts, to give them extra time. So maybe if they need time and a half on a 10 minute quiz, I can just add five minutes here and then I can save it. And now that's one student will have that extra time. All right. So definitely check those out, kind of play around with it. Um, you know, I definitely recommend, you know, looking at all your quiz uh, question types and seeing how you can, you know, utilize them in your course because it's an awesome feature. Okay, so the last thing that I kind of want to talk about that is creating in the creating content area would be pages. So um, I'm going to actually go into the pages tab now in our course navigation. And we don't have any pages created. So again, just like everything else we created, there's that blue plus button up here. In this case, it's plus page. I can click on that and it will open a brand new page up for us. Again, one more time, I'm going to switch over into our course that has content in it and just go to their pages icon and open up a page that they've created so you can kind of get an idea of what you can do. So maybe I'll just up, uh, click on this lecture notes. Uh, again, this instructor really likes these banners, so they created these banners and um, added them to the um, to each aspect of Canvas. But you can see they also kind of just typed in here some lecture notes. They included some images relating to their lecture notes, and they kind of created this page for students to utilize as a resource, which is awesome, right? These can be added into a module. So maybe, you know, you have a couple content pages, and then you have a quiz, and then you have an assignment. All of that can sit in a module really easily. The other thing is, is that you can also embed uh, YouTube videos right onto pages as well. So the last thing that's on this uh, kind of lecture notes content page is a YouTube video in which students can uh, see that content right in there. So that's kind of cool. Um, if I switch back over to my sandbox course, my practice course, um, I can utilize that rich content editor again. I can embed images right here. I could start typing. I could copy and paste content over. I could um, add videos, whether, you know, utilizing the embed um, record or upload video. I could maybe do a kind of lecture on the fly if I wanted to, or I could go to YouTube and embed them. Anything I want is a really powerful tool to do that. Okay, so question on the floor, is there a journals option in Canvas? There really isn't a journals area in Canvas. Um, there's some apps that kind of um, integrate in with Canvas that you can turn on that are great for journals. Um, 
Another kind of way if you're wanting all of your students to kind of see each other's journals is you could create a content page like this and then you have actually have the option to allow teachers and students to edit them so they could edit that content. This is also great for if you're kind of wanting to create a wiki type page where you know you have information on there and then students can come in and um, and create the content and um, you know add content and edit it, you can definitely do that. Yeah, that's a great um, kind of workaround too. Kelly says, it's not called journal, but you can create an assignment and then um, under the assignment options, there's that text entry box and they can just t um, you know type in there as well and that can kind of be their ongoing journal. Cool. All right, so now that we have all of this content, we have content pages, assignments, discussions, quizzes, we're going to be utilizing modules to kind of add that content, kind of create that playlist for our students to go through the items in there and, um, you know, access the content. Um, once we have all of that set up, you know, and our students have access to it, you know, they're going to start submitting stuff, right? 